From Putin's massive secret bunker in southern Russia, to his high-tech submarines that break through thick sea ice near the North Pole. We looked at all the ways the Russian leader has transformed the country since he came to power. We start off in the Russian Arctic, where Putin turned one of the most remote places on Earth into a military training ground. Russia stages some of its Arctic naval exercises in its France Joseph Land archipelago. It's a cluster of 192 islands spread over 6,200 square miles. That's about the size of Connecticut. Temperatures hover at around negative 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Russia held a high-tech training in March 2021. This was the first time the country surfaced three submarines at the same time. Two Delta IVs and one Bori-class submarine, which was introduced in 2013. These are called hydroplanes attached to the fin. They typically lay horizontally, but these are specially designed to rotate vertically to help surface through ice. A standard sub can break through three feet of ice cover, but these shattered over five feet. And that's a big deal because submarines need to break the ice to launch missiles or communicate. The Russian government says it even tested firing a torpedo from under the ice. We could not find footage of it, but this Maxar satellite image shows a hole supposedly caused by the launch. No independent journalists were allowed at the exercise, and all footage was distributed by the Russian Defense Ministry. Russia's northern fleet also carried out exercises on land. The Arctic Brigade uses these Ruslan vehicles, which can carry up to 22 people. They have four sets of tracks, each independently powered to help navigate harsh Arctic terrain. These polar suits are designed to blend in with the snow, and they carry AK-74 machine guns. Russia developed them as an answer to America's M16 after a few were seized during the Vietnam War. The fleet also has at least 30 A1 snowmobiles. They're specially designed to carry a grenade launcher, machine gun, rifle, and two pairs of skis. The fleet also has the T-72, a battle tank from the Soviet era used to fire shells that can destroy other tanks. Their cache of weapons includes this BM-21 Grad multiple rocket launcher. It can fire 40 rockets in just 20 seconds, leaving the adversary no time to take shelter. There's also this coastal defense missile system. Some of these Onyx missiles can target ships nearly 200 miles away. For the very first time, Russia also flew its MiG-31 fighter jets over the North Pole. They have the ability to strike a moving target and can reach over 67,000 feet. That's nearly twice the cruising altitude of a commercial airplane. You can see they also refueled mid-flight, which is hard to do. Magnetic fields at the North Pole make navigating over it especially challenging for pilots. New or old, a lot of the equipment has clear displays of patriotism, like Russia's Red Star, a communist symbol first used by the Red Army during World War I. The flags of the Russian Navy were clearly visible on all submarines, and the bases are painted in the country's national colors, white, red, and blue. President Vladimir Putin claimed the 2021 exercise was a huge success. Подтверждены высокие боевые возможности отечественного вооружения, его надежность при эксплуатации в экстремальных условиях. But why is Russia's military so active in the Arctic? Experts say it's designed to send a message to the West that the Russian military is strong and willing to act. But there's another more strategic reason. As Arctic ice melts, it's opening up new opportunities. The region is believed to hold almost a quarter of the world's untapped oil and gas, valued at about $30 trillion. And the five countries that surround the Arctic have the most to gain. That's Norway, Denmark, Canada, the United States, and Russia, which by far occupies the longest stretch, with 53% of the entire Arctic coastline. The UN gives each of them economic rights, over a 200-mile zone around the north of their coastlines. But there are legal ways of going beyond these limits. In 2007, 
Russia planted its flag on the seabed of the North Pole. Many saw it as the country symbolically staking its claim over the region. Reports project that control over the Arctic's resources would give Russia economic stability. Currently, oil and gas account for roughly 60% of Russia's export revenue and 30% of its federal budget. And experts say that's why Russia is expanding its military bases here. This one is located on Russia's Kotelny Island. It's called Severny Klever, Russian for Northern Clover. It refers to the design that makes it easier for soldiers to reach its sprawling facilities without walking outside. It stocks enough food and fuel to house 250 personnel for an entire year. The base also has a recreational center, with a Russian pool table, ping pong, and even a workout area. Just 1,200 miles away from Severny Klever is another base. This one is called Arktycheski Trilisnik, Russian for Arctic Trefoil, which refers to the three pods extending from the central atrium. This one is the administration center, this is the medical and rec center, and this is the cafeteria. Personnel live inside the star-shaped structure. It's located 600 miles south of the North Pole, on an island called Alexandra Land, and it's built to look like a spaceship. The stilts help it withstand snow. The base covers 150,000 square feet, about three times the size of a football field. There's even a small chapel outside. This landing strip dates back to the Cold War, but satellite images show it's been extended. Now it's the only one in the Arctic that can accommodate all types of aircraft. From here, Russia could protect the Kola Peninsula, which is home to the majority of Russia's naval nuclear arsenal. But foreign policy experts believe the base is also strategically positioned at the western end of an international waterway called the Northern Sea Route. The route stretches from the Bering Strait to the Kara Gates along Russia's Arctic coast and cuts travel time for ships going from Asia to Europe in half compared to the Suez Canal. Russia has utilized it for centuries to deliver food and other supplies to residents who live along its Arctic coastline. But experts say using it more regularly would result in heavy environmental damage. Today, thinning sea ice is making the waterway easier to navigate, and the route has been gaining international attention, especially after the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal in March. In 2020, shipping traffic through the Russian Arctic rose by about 50%, but it amounts to only 3% of the traffic that goes through the Suez Canal. Putin has said he even sees control of the Northern Sea Route as a huge economic opportunity for Russia. As a result, the country has developed a massive fleet of icebreaker ships to access the route year-round. Right now it has about 50, and it's building more. The Arctica is Russia's newest icebreaker. It's thought to be the biggest and strongest ever built. It's 567 feet long, 112 feet wide, and about as tall as a 15-story building. Some point out the beam is designed to make it appear even larger. Here's how it works. Icebreakers have rounded bows, unlike regular ships, which have straight hulls to cut through waves. This allows them to ride up onto the ice and use their weight to crush it from above. Experts estimate the Arctica can crush about 10 vertical feet of ice. But Russia is the only country with icebreaker ships that are nuclear powered, which means they run on uranium and can go as long as seven years without refueling. It's a major advantage out in remote Arctic waters. Today, Russia uses its icebreakers to clear the way for cargo ships and military vessels, and to access natural resources. The US, on the other hand, has only one icebreaker that compares in size to Russia's larger ships, and it was built during the Cold War. It's used for science and research purposes. But at the end of last year, the Polar Star set sail for the Arctic in its first non-scientific mission since 1994. The U.S. Coast Guard said it would help protect U.S. stakes in the region. Russia is closely monitoring the route. It requires all ships passing through to get permission from the Russian government and to have a Russian pilot on board. 
Now, foreign policy experts argue an icebreaker fleet is essential to maintaining international access to Arctic waters. The U.S. is now building up its fleet and expects to have its first new ship by 2024. Even China, which doesn't have any territory in the Arctic, has two of its own. And even though it seems like Putin has an advantage in the Arctic, the war in Ukraine has proven that Russia's army isn't invincible. We went through dozens of videos in the first six weeks of the war, and here's what we found. Russia has been involved in several conflicts in the past decade that made its military look powerful and efficient, as well as ruthless. <laughs> this time, things haven't gone as Mark expected. The Russians have been conducting this operation on a shoestring. In 2014, when the Russians took over Crimea, they did that swiftly and quite effectively. In their operations in Syria, they were brutal, but effective also. So we expected that their operations in Ukraine would be similarly effective. Mark Kansian is a retired Marine Corps colonel and an expert in military operations who's been studying Russia's military since the Cold War. From 2015 to 2020, Russia spent an average of $65 billion annually on its military. In comparison, the United States spent more than 10 times as much during the same period. The Kremlin is first focusing on heavy artillery to shatter cities and break resolve. One thing they're emphasizing, missiles. The Iskander missile, capable of carrying both nuclear and conventional warheads. They've been using it to attack deep targets in Ukraine. Uh, it has high precision. Russia said it had 136 of these types of missiles in 2019. They have a limited inventory. What it indicates is that the Russians are using all of their capabilities in this conflict, even a relatively scarce and important capability like Iskander's. We also asked Mark about Russia's cruise missile inventory. The Russian cruise missile inventory uh, tends to be on the older side. The Russians don't have a whole lot of them. This is a 3M54 caliber, which gets launched from sea to land. Cruise missiles fly like unpiloted aircraft and are typically precision, uh, guided. This missile landed at a bus terminal in Kyiv. Mark says the model came out in the 1990s and has been continuously updated. But this armored vehicle he can identify right away. It was found just a few miles from Kyiv. This is the Vodzdika self-propelled artillery. It looks like a tank, it's not. One of the main differences is that this has bigger guns and can shoot at higher angles than a tank. This rocket system, called GRAD, was first developed in the 1960s. Fires 40 rockets up to 25 miles. These are unguided. They can be very effective against troops, but they're also very dangerous for civilians because they spread out and they're not very accurate. It's certainly one reason why you're seeing civilian facilities being hit. It's hard to know which weapons caused which damage, but scenes like this show that civilian targets across Ukraine have been totally destroyed. We've learned the Russians have a wide variety of drones, including this one, a Russian Orion drone. This appears to be a reconnaissance drone. It seems that the drone is locating the target and another shooter is attacking it and that would be tremendously helpful for the Russians because they have not been very good at reconnaissance so far. They've been frequently ambushed and surprised. But Russia does have about 300 modern combat aircrafts positioned within range of Ukraine, including the Su-34, with its double tail that helps it change direction at high angles. Russia deployed it in the northeast of Ukraine. It's a relatively modern aircraft. It can be a fighter, it can also drop bombs. The Su-24, on the other hand, is old. The Su-24, it's a swing-wing fighter-bomber. can fly low, can fly fast. And interestingly, it's used by both the Ukrainians and the uh, Russians. And you can tell that it's a Su-24 because it has the single tail. But experts say Russia has limited quantities of precision-guided air weapons. Years of combat operations in Syria have depleted their stockpile and may mean that most aircrafts have only unguided bombs and rockets. 
Another reason why the Russian Air Force has fallen behind is because their pilots have about 120 hours of flying practice a year, a lot less than their Western counterparts. So experts say they are struggling to use their complex aircrafts in a conflict zone. But Russia says it deployed the new KH-47M2 Kinzhal missile for the first time in this war, when it blew up a big underground arms depot in Western Ukraine. The Russians claim the Kinzhal can hit a target up to 1,200 miles away and that it's hypersonic, which means it can fly at five times the speed of sound. It's also capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And while Russia has not used nuclear weapons, it has carried out drills with its nuclear forces, like the one seen here in video released by the Russian Defense Ministry days before the invasion. Mark says there's more to come from Putin's army to pulling in additional forces. We're also seeing more air activity, uh, more drone activity. But the Russian military has some issues. Soldiers have been leaving significant resources behind on the battlefield. Take supplies, for example. Here, Ukrainian soldiers found a field full of abandoned Russian tanks. And in this video posted to Twitter, we see Ukrainian farmers towing Russian armored vehicles. Same thing here. Why were they abandoned? It's almost certain that they ran out of gas. If they'd been captured, you know, they probably would have shown some damage, but we, on most of them, we don't see that. They're also using unencrypted communications like smartphones and push-to-talk radios and tree branches to conceal their vehicles, like in this photo posted to Twitter by Ukraine weapons tracker. Another issue for the Russian military, food. Look at these expiration dates. These rations expired in 2015. Two thirds of enlisted Russian troops are volunteers and the other third are conscripts, which means they were forced to enlist. Russia requires all male citizens between the ages of 18 to 27 to register for conscription. But experts say conscripts often have poor training and low morale. There have been multiple reports that Russian soldiers have refused to follow orders and even walked away from their units. So high-ranking officers moved to the front lines instead and were exposed to attacks. So far, Ukraine says it's killed at least six Russian major generals, an unusually high total for senior officers. The Kremlin has acknowledged only three of their deaths. Still, Russia is a much bigger force. It has 850,000 total active duty troops. That's four times as many as Ukraine, which has approximately 200,000. We've also learned about the message the Russian military is sending to its own citizens tied to the symbols that show up in these videos released by the Russian Ministry of Defense. These are Zils, standard heavy trucks the military has used since the Soviet era. What sticks out here are the Zs on the trucks. Z seems to be the most common, but we've also seen V and a couple of other symbols. The so Ukrainians say they designate who the vehicle belongs to or where it comes from. What is interesting is that the Z has been taken up by Russians to show support for the war and people sporting Zs and Zs appearing in a variety of venues. Like this image of a Russian gymnast sporting a Z on his chest. I think you're probably going to see more of it as the Russian government emphasizes the nationalist elements of the conflict. The Russians have said that it stands for to victory and Soviet flags are making a comeback. It harkens back to the days of the Red Army, which was much larger and victorious in the Second World War, which the Russians called the Great Patriotic War. It also harkens back to when Russia was a superpower and resonates with Putin, who looks back on those days with nostalgia. No matter what Putin's goals are today, the Russian media is helping him tell the perfect story. No, 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 no. Russian networks say their troops are winning in a battle against Nazis. They're pushing the narrative that the U.S., NATO, and Ukraine itself did everything to provoke the conflict. The United States is providing weapons uh, for the sole purpose of empowering Ukrainians to kill Russians. And from an American perspective, 
this is a good thing. And that the West is trying to destroy Russia. It's part of the Russian disinformation war playbook. Push out so many fake and partially true versions of a story that it becomes almost impossible to nail down what's real. Russia has this long tradition of disinformation campaigns and coming up with new ways to spread disinformation narratives. This video is also making the rounds in Russia. The report claims to show the aftermath of a deadly bomb allegedly set off by Ukrainians on February 22nd. This was the first one where they were really focusing on the fact that Ukraine was targeting civilians and killing civilians in the separatist region. Oliver Alexander is an investigator who collects and analyzes data from open sources. He has gained over 38,000 Twitter followers for his work debunking videos from all over the world. He says upon close inspection, things didn't really add up. The damage to the car isn't indicative of what you'd expect from an explosion that then caused the car to catch fire like this. The holes in the side are very uniform very round, more indicative of a bullet hole. The driver in particular, you can see in the skull, has cuts here that are very obviously made post-mortem for an autopsy. Another network also showed the same incident. This time, the bodies of the victims were blurred, making it harder to tell that this video is fake. I think it is incredibly difficult for members of the public to actually scrutinize all of this information that they may be seeing. Abbas Pangjwani is an open source investigator at Full Fact, a UK-based fact-checking non-profit. I think a lot of the public's ability to scrutinize information is going to come via intermediaries like fact-checking organizations or open source researchers. You can't even get access to them due to language barriers or other barriers in the countries that are most affected by the propaganda. You're starting at a massive disadvantage to actually be able to see through all of this misinformation and disinformation. While Russia has repeatedly bombed Ukrainian schools and hospitals, broadcasts blame Ukrainian forces for the same kinds of war crimes inside their own country. In February, the Russian military accused Ukraine of attacking this kindergarten. And Russia claimed it was located in a part of Ukraine held by Russian separatists. But the Russian claim about where the kindergarten was was debunked by open source investigators. The building wasn't in the location that they had initially claimed it was in. Ukrainian military-controlled territory. The Russian Ministry of Education responded in this video designed to explain the war to Russian children. И таких фейков, поверь мне, очень много. И с каждым днём их становится всё больше и больше. Ракета, попавшая в детский сад. Russia has also denied well-documented evidence that the Russian military is attacking civilian targets. Удары исключали поражение гражданской инфраструктуры и жилых домов. Мне сегодня сделал и пресс-секретарь президента Дмитрий Песков цитата: "Российские войска в ходе спецоперации не осуществляют каких-либо ударов по объектам гражданской инфраструктуры". During the first week of the war, the Russian government and state broadcasts showed these videos. They claimed the BBC falsely accused Russia of shelling this residence in Kharkiv. А вот на самом деле, что было в реальности, это Донецк. Это жилой дом в Донецке. Не хочу говорить так, есть у нас шансы. Конечно, есть. Правда, она всегда победит. Эти фейки, люди живут в фейковой реальности. We checked, and this building is in fact in Donetsk, where Russia says it is. But the BBC never actually claimed otherwise. This image was taken from the site's live updates blog, where the video keeps changing, somewhat like autoplay. The article they point to doesn't mention the building. State-owned TV networks also have a long history of railing against the U.S. and NATO. And even the Western experts they feature support that message. The Ukrainians are in the middle. They're the ones that are the ones getting shot. They're fighting and dying for the U.S., uh, not for their own independence. Most people who observe this country know that you really can't trust what the United States uh, says in terms of its foreign policy. We are uh, pretty notorious for uh, doing whatever we want. 
They've even added subtitles to American talk shows to help defend the Kremlin. Hating Putin has become the central purpose of America's foreign policy. Very soon, that hatred of Vladimir Putin could bring the United States into a conflict in Eastern Europe. Before that happens, it might be worth asking yourself, since it is getting pretty serious, what is this really about? Why do I hate Putin so much? In this leaked memo obtained by Mother Jones, the Kremlin even recommends that Russian broadcasters use as many Tucker Carlson clips as possible because he sharply criticizes the provocative behavior of Western leaders. And over the course of the conflict, misinformation has come from all sides. Shortly after the invasion, Western media outlets showed this video of Ukrainian men standing up to Russians at Snake Island, off the coast of Ukraine. It was claimed that they'd been killed. Um, all of them had been killed, and they were offered you know, military honors posthumously by the President Zelensky. Then, a couple of days later, Russian news released this video showing that the men were actually alive, and that turned out to be true. But Peter Adams, who works as a misinformation specialist for the News Literacy Project, says he's seen several examples of non-Russian accounts posting fake videos. It gives Russian government disinformation sources more fodder, right, to say that uh, other people are engaged in lying and trying to deceive you. Like this video game footage, for example. A Facebook account said it showed Russia attacking Ukraine. You have a um, what appears to be a phalanx Sea Whiz close-in weapon system firing thousands of rounds towards this, which first of all is not a weapon system Ukrainians have, and second of all, it fires 20 millimeter cartridges, and the plane gets hit several times, and nothing really happens with it. Videos from video games being shared as as actual conflict videos is extremely prevalent and it happens in almost every conflict it's happened many many times especially even on mainstream media the russian ministry of education used the video game example to teach children about misinformation coming from the west кто-то даже берет кадры из компьютерных игр докладывает звук и выдает за правду прежде чем размещать какую-либо информацию в социальных сетях обязательно необходимо проверить but debunking fake videos that push the Kremlin line could get you arrested in Russia. And a new law threatens journalists with a 15-year prison term for contradicting the government, including by calling the war a war, rather than a special military operation. And as the violence escalates, Putin has been going to great lengths to keep himself safe. We took a look at his secret billion-dollar palace overlooking the Black Sea. The 190,000-square-foot mansion is near the resort town of Gelenjik in southern Russia. That's 1,000 miles away from his official residence, the Grand Kremlin Palace in Moscow. Diagrams reveal that this mansion has 11 bedrooms above ground and a high-security bunker below. The bunker was constructed to have two different supplies of oxygen. There is at least a tunnel to bring additional provisions. A drawing shows the two tunnels are hidden in the hill under the mansion. They are around 130 and 200 feet long. Cross-sectional sketches show 15-inch thick concrete walls that appear to be blast-proof. The tunnels also have multiple ventilation shafts in case of a chemical attack that could pollute the air. And they're equipped with a fresh water supply, sewage lines, and a fire system. Everything Putin would need to survive for weeks at a time. There's also a lot of space to store cables. There are racks and racks and racks for conduit. It can be for power, it can be fiber optic cable, for internet, for the phone, so that if the worst happens, all this power, all of this communications will continue to flow into Putin's palace. An elevator shaft connects the tunnels. The lower one includes a moving walkway leading to the beach on the Black Sea, allowing for a quick escape. These tunnels were built over 10 years ago. That shows how long Putin has obsessed over his safety. This is back when Putin was meeting with US presidents, when there was like a reset button. We now know that in the back of his head, he was making preparations for existential conflict with the West. 
3D renderings also reveal how luxurious this palace really is. There's an enormous guest house. There's a church. There is a hookah lounge with what appears to be a stripper pole. There is a special dormitory, a separate complex of buildings intended to house staff and security guards. There is what appears to be a comms communication center. Uh, it's got almost everything you could imagine. These plans were first posted online in early 2010 by a Russian construction company called MetroStyle. They were actually hired as a private contractor to dig the bunkers underneath Putin's palace. So there was a screen capture of these old diagrams. And then that circulated for years among Russians on like obscure message boards. An anonymous source within these networks called Postman forwarded them to Insider in May. He is a Russian man and a member of a group who calls itself Sect Z. He and his fellow diggers were against the war and they were against the crackdown on their community that's been taking place in Russia in recent years. But many Russians first found out about the palace in a 2021 documentary by Putin's political opponent, Alexei Navalny. The home is set to be privately funded by one of Putin's closest associates. The Russian oligarch, that's the person who owns the property on paper. I believe there's evidence that, that Putin himself is, has, has traveled there multiple times. Now, is there a deed with his name on it that shows in black and white that he owns it? I'm not sure that there is. Putin has other similar assets. A Russian media outlet revealed that he has a three-story fishing villa in Finland. A close friend reportedly built the $3.2 million mansion for Putin. It is set to have a security house, a wine cellar, and a billiard room. And that's not it. There is a lot of public funds that are going towards building and renovation of different kind of bunkers and tunnels across Russia that could be used for something better that could be used to make Russia a better place and to help Ukrainians rebuild their country after the damage that Russia has done to it. All leaders of nuclear states make emergency plans. The U.S. government has a hideout under the White House. There's a bomb shelter at Camp David and a nuclear bunker at Mount Weather. But Putin's palace is different. What it's designed to do is ensure the continuity of one person. Of, of, of Putin. It's focused on him and, and, and him staying alive. And he's not going to live forever, but the, the, it's very unlikely that the palace will pass on to the next leader of Russia. So when Putin is gone, who could come next? Experts told us Sergei Shoigu is among the most extreme of Putin's men. <laughs> He's Russia's defense minister and one of the architects behind the war in Ukraine. Putin and him are almost always side by side. Shoigu represents the kind of deep Russia, the kind of romantic the Siberian tribes going on hunting trips with Shoigu. That kind of is part of the branding of, of Putin as a man of the people, a man who understands the breadth and depth of Russia. And Shoigu's used his time as the head of the emergency situations ministries to build his own brand. He traveled the country for two decades, announcing rescue efforts after natural disasters, telling people their government had everything under control. And Russians began to trust him. He was the second most popular politician after Putin. Over the years, Shoigu has had many wins, like leading Russia to victory in annexing Crimea and helping Bashar al-Assad remain in power. But time is not on Shoigu's side. Shoigu is himself 67, Putin is 69, so that's not a big difference. I would assume that Putin will want to hand over power to somebody who is going to be in power for a long time. He's going to want to go to the younger generation. Somebody like this man, Dmitry Kovalev, the 36-year-old head of Putin's presidential administration department. 
he was spotted having an intimate conversation with Putin at Russia's Victory Day parade. He's a new guy. He's not biased towards any particular member of the existing elite. And being new may just be his biggest asset. Putin was only 47 years old back in 1999. He was very charismatic. He was very quick on his feet in talking to journalists and talking to the public. That was an important part of his path to power. But now Putin is 69 years old. So the age factor may be more relevant than ever. Even Putin has said he'd want someone young to succeed him. This clip made the rounds online. People noted his hunched position, his firm grip on the table, his fidgeting hands and feet. He just looks generally uncomfortable. The Kremlin has repeatedly denied the claim that Putin is sick. Which brings us to 60-year-old Sergei Kirienko. He came to prominence already in the, in the 1990s as a banker, promoting economic reforms. Since 2016, Kirienko has been the first deputy chief of staff of the presidential executive office. More recently, Putin put him in charge of rebuilding territory Russia took from Ukraine. Putin surrounds himself with people who display loyalty. Kirienko is part of that team. But Kirienko proved that long before Russia invaded Ukraine. Kirienko was in charge of domestic politics, organizing the election campaigns. So that puts him in a powerful position. Dmitry Medvedev, who was handpicked to be president from 2008 to 2012, has historically been much less hostile towards the West. Unlike Putin, he was not a member of the Communist Party. So he is the first post-Soviet leader that Russia has seen. Welcome, my friend and partner. Medvedev met with then-President Obama and signed a treaty that aimed to curb the spread of nuclear weapons. But Putin only allowed him to serve one term. People saw Medvedev as just a shell, a puppet figure for Putin. Since then, Medvedev has been changing his tune. He's been very aggressively attacking the West and defending the war. He's even said that Russia is saving the Ukrainian people. Sergei Sobyanin has been much less vocal about the war. The mayor of Moscow for the last 12 years, he's proven to be another viable candidate. He's popular, he's well known, and he's a competent manager. And three years after he took office, annual investment in Moscow had grown by 50%. Experts say Moscow's economy accounts for roughly 40% of Russia's GDP, which makes him a pretty powerful figure. So Byanin comes from the main oil-producing region of Russia, the Tumen province, where he was governor from 2001 to 2005. So presumably he also has good connections with the oil industry. And the war in Ukraine is giving Sobyanin a new opportunity to get involved. Putin has asked major Russian cities to help rebuild newly occupied territory in Ukraine. Moscow has been assigned to the Luhansk People's Republic. But rebuilding is dangerous. A car bomb killed a Russian deputy head on June 24th, and again on July 11th. That'll be a test of their loyalty to patriotism. That presumably would be one path into power. But even if Sobyanin doesn't double down in Ukraine, he could take over if Putin leaves without naming a successor. But there's also Alexei Navalny. People even outside Russia already recognize his name. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. That's because he is Putin's biggest critic. Alexei Navalny is a lawyer and political activist who created a grassroots movement to attack corruption in Russian officialdom. The now 46-year-old opposition leader was barred from running for president in 2018. 
because of a fraud conviction which many saw as political payback. During my campaign, I spent every fifth day in the jail. So now I'm kind of, you know, used to it. But experts say Navalny has still massively impacted Russian politics. He had his own YouTube channel where he posted very well-made videos exposing corruption of top officials in Russia, including President Putin himself. Tens of millions of Russians have watched his videos, so some of his ideas have seeped through into the mass of the population. But the Kremlin has repeatedly tried to silence him, most famously by allegedly poisoning him in August 2020, and he almost died. This is Alexei Navalny, some time after he was poisoned. Experts say it would be unlikely for Navalny to succeed Putin. The Putin regime has become very expert at shutting down the opposition. Vyacheslav Volodin went from being a Putin critic to a Putin supporter. He is the speaker of the Russian parliament and has gone so far as to say that without Putin, there is no Russia. And he's made sure the Kremlin can pass any law it wants to. He started off as a regional politician from Saratov, part of the Volga region that accounts for about 40% of Russia's population. Presumably, Volodin has more of a sense of the diversity of Russia, of the poverty that's present in most of Russia still and would hopefully try and orient the Russian economy more towards national development and not fighting wars. That's something Nikolai Patrushev doesn't have. It would be just very difficult for the Kremlin to sell Patrushev to the Russian people as somebody who understands their daily lives. That's because he was a spy for 50 years. He even served with Putin in the KGB. Now he's the head of the Security Council. He's part of the inner circle of four or five officials who are closest to Putin. Experts say he's likely the mastermind behind Russia's recent wars. Nikolai Patrushev has been consistently hardline in opposing the West, and presumably he has pulled Putin more and more into that position. But like other senior officials, Patrushev's age may be his biggest issue. Patrushev is older, is a couple of years older than Putin. He would be an interim figure. As for who that real leader could actually be? We should expect the unexpected in the Putin transition. It's very possible that he will pick somebody that, who is not now a radar. But regardless of who comes next, Putin has said his successor should carry on his legacy and be somebody he trusts to look after Russia once he's gone. <laughs>